Good morning. Welcome to the online worship service of Laguna Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that you are joining with us in worship. I'd like to introduce Gail Onadera, our co-director of Children's Ministry, to share the ministry happenings here at Laguna Presbyterian Church. Thanks, Steve. So in addition to our online service, we gather in person for church every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. in our beautiful sanctuary. We also gather for church outside at 10.30 a.m. on Sundays in our 3rd Street parking lot. You can bring a beach chair or not, we'll have a seat ready for you. And at 10.30, the children, preschool through fifth grade, they meet in our Tankersley Hall with myself and Maggie, and our middle school and high school students meet in our youth center located below the sanctuary with Cam. Our chancel choir will begin rehearsals on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. starting September 9th. This will be safely done in person on our LPC campus. We're so excited. Please, anyone can join. Contact Linda White through the church office. So our gals group will gather again for fellowship and a meal on Sunday, September 12th at 4 p.m. This will be in a home of one of our gals. And this caring community is for women of all ages who have lost their significant other. And they also gather once a month. The cost for September's gathering is $20, and this will include appetizer, dinner, dessert, and beverages. So please RSVP no later than September 6th to the email on your ad on email address below. Okay, our fall book talk has been chosen, and the book is The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. Now, this book talk will be on Tuesday, October 5th at 4 p.m., so you've got some time to read it and we will announce the location soon. So if you're interested in traveling to Israel next year, May 9th through the 20th, 2022, this will be with Pastor Steve Sweet and our recently retired Associate Pastor Kathy Sizer. Please join us for an information meeting that will be happening on September 19th, which is a Sunday at 1130 in our Tankersley Hall. If you have questions, this meeting will be great to answer those questions. Questions about the itinerary, information about the optional Jordan extension to Amazing Petra. All your questions can be answered. And the cost of the trip is $2,800 per person. This will be double occupancy plus the cost of your airfare. So let us know if you're interested by sending an email to the address below. This is going to be a great trip. If you have any interest, please don't miss it. All right, next week we'll be sharing more details about all of our exciting fall happenings, our sermon series, our adult ed opportunities, MOPS is starting, we'll give you those dates, Homework Club is starting for our kids, we're so excited, and so much more. So stay tuned next week for all of that. Chancel flowers are given this morning by Shelby Rigg, in loving memory of Steve. Thank you, Gail. This morning, we welcome guest preacher, the Reverend Dr. Mark Roberts. Mark is the senior strategist for Fuller Theological Seminary's Max Dupree Center for Leadership. Their focus is on the spiritual development and thriving of leaders. Mark is the principal writer of the daily devotional, Life for Leaders. He has an amazing spouse, Linda Roberts, and two grown children, Nathan and Kara, who are educators on the high school and college level. Mark was senior pastor of Irvine Presbyterian Church, a part of our presbytery. And Mark will be preaching from Acts 26, telling your story. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise you as the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let your spirit guide us to be your witnesses and to share the hope that we have in the gospel. Accept our praise and adoration, we pray. For we offer them in Jesus' name, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The words of the psalmist invite us to worship this day. We will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, we will remember your wonders of old. We will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. 
We will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever, and make known your faithfulness to every generation.
where sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you Temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. So teach my soul to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. You're my hope and stay Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has passed away. A new life has begun. Know that we are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. Good, good morning. Oh, good morning, Gail. How are you? I know you're starting school on Monday. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm a little worried I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight, like right before you go to Disneyland, right? Yeah, we're just right. so excited. We're so excited to have our kids and our families back on campus tomorrow. I can't wait. But good. I have, but I do have one concern. Uh oh. We've got a lot of kids who are brand new to our school. Their families might be brand new to our school, and and they don't really know a whole lot of people. And I just want to make sure they have a great day and that they enter their classroom and make new friends and just yes. have a really great time. Yeah, making friends, it, that's a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. And that's actually what we're talking about in Sunday school. I know. Perfect timing. It is. And so we're talking about friendship because friendship is a big thing. You know, you have to be friendly, right? And smile and talk to people to make friends, which I know you're teaching the kids. And you have to commit to a friendship. You have to stick by that friend through thick and thin, through good times and bad. And sometimes that can be difficult. And sometimes it's so difficult that maybe you're not friends with the same people all the time, which is okay. But we're talking about a friendship that is the ultimate friendship. Okay, Ooh. I think you can guess. Oh. So in order to demonstrate this a little better, I have our friendly balloon. Doesn't he look friendly? Oh, he looks so, he's very I cute, know. very friendly. Isn't he cute, yes. right? So our friendly balloon, like I'm sure a lot of your kids tomorrow, they, he wants to make a lot of friends. And we're gonna say that these cut up pieces of paper are all the friends that he wants okay. to make, right? Spread Look at how cute those here. guys are, right? Oh, really yes. fun friends. Well, in order to do that, you know, you gotta stick by one, one another. You gotta stick by your friend, like we said. And to make some sticky stuff happen, 
I'm gonna make some static on our friend balloon guy here. Let's see if it works, and my hair is gonna love oh, it. Yeah. I'm excited to see oh, how your hair looks after oh, this too. We're making it happen. Okay, so our friendly guy here really wants to have these friends stick to him. Let's see. Whoa. Oh, see, look, look at how all friendly he is. Friends he made being friendly. Isn't that I amazing? I mean, not everybody wanted to be his friend, but that happens, and that's I okay, know. right? And he's still trying, right? Yep. But, you know, as we said, we go through some hard times. And sometimes oh. our friends oh. don't stick by us. Yeah, some of them kind of fell away when he was going yep. through some hard times there. I know. But you However, said something about somebody who's always our friend. Yes, you're right. And our Bible is a great place to read about that. Okay. So, Jesus will always be your friend through thick and thin, good times and bad, sick, health, rich, poor, any of it. Happy, Jesus, grumpy, even, yeah, exactly. even if I knock over his, belt, his block tower. Exactly. And he is committed 100% to us. The biggest commitment, and we can always count on him to stick by us. You know, one of the great verses that we're going to talk about in Sunday school is Proverbs 18. And it talks about that God, that Jesus sticks by us, God sticks by us, stronger than a brother. That oh, that relationship wow. is stronger than a brother. You know, brothers have really strong relationships. And Jesus will stick by us through it all. And I really hope that your kids make some really great friends. We will be praying for that, that these children will be making great friends. And all of our kids starting school will develop these great friendships that will last a long time. But will always know that Jesus will be committed to them through everything. I love that. I, I think I think this would also make a great preschool chapel. Oh, I think we should do it. Yeah. Sounds great. All right, friends, we will see you soon. Hear now the word of the Lord from Acts 26, beginning with verse 1. Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began to defend himself. I consider myself fortunate that this, that it is before you, King Agrippa. I am to make my defense today against all the accusations of the religious leaders, because you are especially familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg of you to listen to me patiently. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, a life spent from the beginning among my own people and in Jerusalem. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that I have belonged to the strictest sect of our religion and lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial on account of my hope in the promise made by God to our ancestors, a promise that our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship day and night. It, it is for this hope, Your Excellency, that I am accused by Jews. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and that is what I did in Jerusalem. With authority received from the chief priests, I not only locked up many of the saints in prison, but I also cast my vote against them when they were being condemned to death. By punishing them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blast me. Uh, and since I was so furiously enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. With this in mind, I was traveling to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. When at midday along the road, Your Excellency, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my companions. When we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goats. I asked, who are you, Lord? The Lord answered, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you to serve and testify to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. 
I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. After that, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout the countryside of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do deeds consistent with repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had help from God, and so I stand here, testifying to both small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. While he was making this defense, Festus exclaimed, You are out of your mind, Paul. Too much learning is driving you insane. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking the sober truth. Indeed, the king knows about these things, and to him I speak freely. And for I am certain that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, Are you so quickly persuading me to become a Christian? Paul replied, Whether quickly or not, I pray to God that not only you, but also all all who are listening to me today might become such as I am, except for these chains. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello. You may be wondering why I have shown up in the middle of your worship service. I promise you that I'm not trying to hack your service. I'm actually the preacher today, uh, and I'm preaching this weekend at church but wasn't able to come down for the taping. So your gracious staff have allowed me to uh, go ahead and do the taping from my home. So I'm preaching to you from my home today. I'm grateful for the chance to preach at Laguna Press. Uh, I'm honored to be invited. And so thanks to Pastor Steve and Pastor Beth and to the session for this invitation. I appreciate it. And I, I just want to say how thankful I am for your church. I've known Laguna Press for 30 years now, ever since my installation as pastor at Irvine Press. Uh, your former pastor, Jerry Tankersley, was the one who was officiating at that service. And since then, I have known so many of you, and we've partnered in different ways in ministry. Uh, I'm so grateful for who you are, and I'm especially grateful for your witness to Christ in the community of Laguna. And that's actually what I want to talk with you a little bit about this morning. Uh, I want to talk about your witness for Christ. You know, for many of us in today's world, it's not easy to talk about our faith. We're aware of how uh, many Christians can be very insensitive when they do that, and we don't want to be like those folks. We also sense a major shift in our culture in that uh, it, it's just harder and harder to talk about faith and for that to be welcomed. And yet we sense uh, a calling to share the love of God in Christ with people. So we're, we're kind of caught in a bind sometimes. Our current challenges, however, are nothing like those faced by the Apostle Paul. Uh, in your sermon series on the book of Acts, you have heard how Paul uh, was, was an effective and a bold preacher. And you may, may also have seen that got it, that got him in some trouble. But as we move further into Acts, the trouble gets even greater. In Acts 21, Paul goes to Jerusalem. He's accused by some, some of the Jews for, of defiling the temple. And so they try to kill him. The Roman authorities get involved, and ultimately they send him to Caesarea, the kind of the governor's um, center of, of the Roman uh, area there. And uh, Paul was actually there in Caesarea for a couple of years under house arrest. 
During that time, King Agrippa came to Caesarea. Uh, now, the governor at the time, Festus, told Agrippa about Paul and the problems he'd been having. And so Agrippa decided he wanted to hear uh, from he wanted to hear from Paul face to face. And so they set up that kind of encounter. And that was where we uh, got our scripture reading this morning from Acts 26, Paul's uh, message to and then uh, conversation with Agrippa and with Festus. Now, we don't have time today for an in-depth look at all the, all the ways in which this passage uh, is relevant to us as we think about sharing our faith. But I do want to highlight three things that I think stand out and can be helpful to us as we think about how we share our faith in today's world. So, first of all, we see that Paul knows his audience, and he speaks appropriately. We see that as he begins in speaking to the king. He says, I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I'm to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, because you are especially familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews, and therefore I beg of you to listen to me patiently. Um, if ever you're invited to speak uh, to a king, you should probably start out honoring and praising the king. That's a good rule of thumb. And you better know what you're talking about if you're going to make a good impression. And that was true of Paul. King Agrippa, who, by the way, was the great-grandson of King Herod, uh, was indeed familiar with Jewish customs and controversies because he worked a lot with the Jewish leaders. In fact, uh, Agrippa actually appointed the high priest in Jerusalem. Well, there's another place in the middle of Paul's speech where he quite intentionally connects with his Greco-Roman audience. And it's in that odd thing that Jesus says to Paul. He says, it hurts you to kick against the goads. Now, I imagine that most of us have no idea really what that means. Uh, in fact, the goads were a pointed tool that farmers used to uh, motivate their beasts of burden to get going. And so if an ox kicked against the goads, uh, this sharp point, that would be a fairly painful thing. Uh, classical Greek writers picked up this phrase, kicking against the goads, and used it to describe somebody who was resisting his destiny or her destiny. And so by using this phrase, kick against the goads, Paul is really connecting with his audience and he's also showing that he has a familiarity with their culture and their literature. You know, if we had more time, we could see how in this speech and in speeches throughout Acts, Paul is continually finding ways to connect with his audience. Uh, if you want to see a great example, see his speech on Mars Hill in Acts 17. Paul carefully adapts his witness to the people that he is speaking with and communicating with. And you and I can do the same thing. Now, I expect many of you do this already, whether intuitively or quite intentionally. Uh, as you talk about the things you experience and you believe, you're careful to honor those with whom you're conversing. Uh, you work hard at listening, which is always a good idea. And so the example of Paul encourages us uh, to know those with whom we communicate and to speak in a respectful way way that takes seriously their experience. That's the first thing. The second thing we see in Acts 26 is Paul telling his own story with humility and emphasizing God's grace. Now, many times in the book of Acts, Paul tells the story of his conversion and call, and each one is a little different, though some things are common. And one of the common things is that in Paul's story, he is not the hero. He shares quite humbly how he persecuted the church, which I know is painful for Paul. Uh, and he, he, he doesn't become a Christian because he uh, has a superior study of, of the Old Testament or because he pursued the truth. Rather, he encounters Jesus. Jesus encounters him, really, on the road to Damascus. So Paul's not the hero. And the second consistent theme in Paul's story is that it's not about him and his worthiness but it's about God and God's grace. Nobody hearing Paul's uh, witness would say, wow, Paul is a great guy. They might say, wow, Jesus is pretty amazing. 
And so friends, one of the best ways we can share our faith with others is by simply telling our story honestly and openly. And as we do, making sure we point to the grace of God, you know, not to our own awesomeness. You know, one way I do that in these days is by talking about how God saved my life five years ago. So five years ago, this day, exactly five years ago, I was in Huntington Hospital with a mysterious disease that had made me unbearably sick. When my wife, Linda, took me to the emergency room, they did a bunch of tests. They couldn't figure out what was going on. They were going to send me home. But Linda insisted that I get more attention and that they don't send me on. And they brought in an infectious disease specialist who began to work with me. Uh, had it not been for Linda's insistence and had it not been for the expertise of this doctor, I mean, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, as she began to sense what I might have, she literally started treating me with every antibiotic under the sun. I had seven antibiotics, one after another, round the clock intravenously. And that ended up fighting and ultimately winning over Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which was the disease I got while hiking in the Sierra and got a tick bite I never knew about. Now, when I tell this story, I'm certainly not the hero. Uh, by the time I got to the hospital, I was so sick that I didn't know what month it was, and I didn't know how tall I was, seriously. And if it weren't for Linda and then for Dr. Schreiner, uh, I wouldn't be here. So this, uh, but this for me isn't just an experience of a loving spouse and a great doctor. It was for me really an experience of God's amazing grace, reaching out and literally saving my life. And, you know, when I share that with folks, it's a way of speaking openly about my experience and belief that this was about God's healing in my life. Now, I expect you have stories of God's grace that are like that. And they may well be stories of God's grace in the midst of suffering or difficulty. Uh, perhaps you could share some of those stories with others, or perhaps you're already doing that. And if you are, I think Paul would be pleased. The third thing that Paul does that I want to underscore is to use self-effacing humor. We find this in the scene right after he finishes his main speech. The governor Festus exclaims, You are out of your mind, Paul. Too much learning is driving you insane. And Paul responds ref respectfully, calling him most excellent Festus and saying he is speaking the sober truth. He adds that King Agrippa believes the Old Testament prophets, to which Agrippa counters, are you so quickly persuading me to become a Christian? Paul replies, and this is, this is great. He says, whether quickly or not, I, I do pray to God, not only, that not only you, but also all who are listening to me today might become such as I am, uh, except for these chains. Now, I realize this is the Bible, and we tend to read the Bible as if it's very serious. But along with many commentators, I believe that Paul's last comment was ironic. He was making a kind of a joke. I mean, he says he wants the king to become just like him, well, except for these chains. <laughs> Duh. Um, and I can imagine King Agrippa having a good chuckle over that one. So not only was Paul showing his sense of humor, but it, it, it was humor that was self-effacing. He was acknowledging something about himself that wasn't so good. After all, chains were uncomfortable. They were constricting and humiliating. And so Paul makes a joke in, in, in a way that doesn't make him look so good, but kind of laughs at his condition. In my experience, we Christians could sometimes use a little more humor as we share the story of our faith with others. And, and yes, we ought to be serious about certain things. I'm not saying it's all a joke. We are serious about the death and resurrection of Jesus, about sin and salvation. But I think we could do well if we sometimes could laugh at ourselves a little more, laugh at some of the strange things even we do and say as Christians. I've often told a story about myself and my own silliness. It comes from... Uh, my sophomore year of college, I became eager to share my faith with someone. I was very serious about this, but as a naturally shy person, I, that was a problem. 
So one Friday evening, I was praying about this, and as I prayed, I felt a strong inclination to go down to the local public square and uh, to find somebody to evangelize. Um, now, I, I wouldn't usually recommend that approach. I said the story kind of illustrates my silliness. And uh, for at least a half hour, though, I was walking around the square looking for someone that I can evangelize. I have no idea what I was thinking I was going to see. I mean, what does somebody who wants to talk about Christ look like? <laughs> Lost or crying or I don't know what. But I kept looking. No luck. At the end of the half hour, I, I just felt really embarrassed. Like, what am I doing here? And I decided to go back to my dorm. And just then, a, a college-age woman came up to me and said, do you know how to get to Dunster House? Well, Dunster House was a dorm about 10 minutes away. I said, oh, yeah, I, I, could, I could walk you to Dunster House. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is so great. I'm going to get to talk with her about God in this walk. This is perfect, my big chance. And so all the way to Dunster House, I keep trying to bring up things like the meaning of life and what are you really living for. And she, she had no interest, zero interest. She just wanted to go to Dunster House to party. She didn't want to talk to some guy about things that matter in life. And so we got to the dorm and I let her go. And I just felt really stupid. Uh, I, I said to myself, you know, you are such a dork. <laughs> and I, I determined to go back to my dorm at that point. So I'm, I'm walking away from Dunster House. And this guy, some guy, passes me on the sidewalk. And then all of a sudden I hear behind me, I hear, hey, and, and I turn around and look, and he's, he's looking at me. He says, hey, are you Mark Roberts? Well, I didn't recognize the guy, so I thought this is pretty weird. I said, uh, yeah, why do you ask? And he says, I need to talk to you about God. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's exactly what he said that way. <laughs> and I was, of course, kind of stunned amazed and and we did we went into his dorm room and we talked about god for a lot of hours and you know what i love about this story the one is just my own dorkiness if you will i i mean my approach to evangelism was pretty pathetic i, I would have done much better if i had just you know said to some of my friends in the dorm hey you know i'd love to talk to you about something that matters a lot to me they're my friends they would have listened uh, so I love, you know, I'm, it's a silly story, but I love God's amazing grace and honoring my intentions. And I've often wondered if God even had a bit of a chuckle as this guy was saying to me, I want to talk to you about God. Well, friends, I, I haven't done the go down to the square and uh, find a victim for evangelism thing anymore in my life. And in retrospect, retrospect, as I say, I, I should have just talked to some of my friends. That would have been so much easier. But I guarantee you I've done a lot of other silly things and, and it's good for me to be able to laugh at myself and it's good sometimes to share some of that humor with others, especially as we talk about things like our faith. Well, much more could be said about Paul and his example for us and how he teaches us and inspires us to share our faith. But I think we've learned some things that can be helpful, three things. First, Paul teaches us to know our audience and to speak appropriately. We can communicate in ways that connect with and respect those with whom we're speaking. Second, Paul tells his own story with humility and emphasizing God's grace. Paul is not the hero of his story. Jesus is the hero. And third, Paul uses humor, even self-effacing humor. A little humor goes a long way when we're talking about faith. So my prayer for you today and for your church is that God will continue to help you bear witness in your community. Maybe he'll even stretch you to share in some new ways. And as that happens, I pray that the example of Paul will inspire you and instruct you. Amen. You call me out upon the waters 
the great unknown where feet may fail and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you abounds in deepest waters your sovereign hand will be my guide where fear may fail and fear surrounds me you never failed and you won't start now and I will call upon your name And so let us come and pray for the church, the needs of the world, and for those around us. And our prayer response today will be, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Father, we pray for the church that we might show forth our faith in action, regard all with impartiality, and be quick to listen and slow to anger. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our nation, that whenever trials may befall us, that God may grant us endurance, discernment, and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world, for the people of Afghanistan, for those injured and killed in the explosions near Kabul airport, including the two U.S. Marines. Lord, bring an end to the violence. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, the injured, the vulnerable, and those undergoing all forms of adversity, that they may all be raised up, especially those whose names we mention now in this moment of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for students, teachers, and administrators returning to school this week. Watch over them, encourage them, deepen their learning and wisdom, and a desire to contribute to the welfare of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have lost loved ones and are grieving this week, that they would draw near to you, O God, and that you would draw near to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, let our prayers be offered to you with the gentleness that is born from your wisdom from above, that is pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, and full of mercy. And so we pray together the prayer that you taught every disciple to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, how can we pray for you? We invite you to send your prayer request to the email that you see on the screen. We want you to know that we will be praying for you throughout the week, and your requests are kept confidential. With gratitude for God's faithfulness and with thanksgiving for all that we've received, we are invited to give back to God in our tithes and offerings. On your screen are the ways you can partner with LPC financially. It's your giving that sustains this ministry and all that God is doing through Laguna Presbyterian Church in our communities and in the world. To date, you have generously given $89,002 towards our goal of $120,000 for the month of August, with $30,998 to reach our goal. On behalf of all of us at LPC, thank you. Thank you for your prayers and for your generous giving. As a people of faith, we have gathered for worship. As a people of faith, we go into God's world. Go out to share your story of faith. Go out and give a living witness to God's love active in the world. Go, knowing that God goes with you. Amen. Be gracious. The Lord be gracious.